با هایی کهتوی بود که یه جسته میشه جشی و سعی رو بدین تهاریز و برای سعی رو بدین قایم مومن Yeah, certainly. Um, so yeah, my name's Catherine Jackson and uh, I live in Edinburgh and work full time um, in employability. Based from home, as a result of the pandemic, I would normally have been out and about, um, but because of the because of COVID-19, I've had to be based um, from home. So predominantly, I've been, over the last 30 years, been working in the charity sector with um, people who are profoundly deaf from the deaf community or are deaf and or hard of hearing, um, have a sight loss and or have other disabilities or are long-term health conditions. So about two years ago, um, I experienced severe pain in both of my hands, um, especially when I was typing or texting. Um, and this actually got really quite bad over a number of months. So eventually I went to the doctor um, and I was uh, diagnosed with osteoarthritis in both of my hands, particularly at the base of each thumb. Um, so at that time, it had a huge effect on my, my life because I thought, oh my goodness, I wasn't able to drive. I had difficulty dressing myself. Um, I couldn't cut up food. And in terms of my work, I really struggled to type or um, use my computer. And that's a huge part of my job because working from home, everything was online from Zoom meetings to team meetings to emails, so so dependent on that. So I had a really very supportive doctor and I got, was put on medication, I went physiotherapy really quickly, and I was really keen to know more about the condition myself and how I could manage and adjust and, and, and accept this long-term health condition. So um, as a result of support, I um, saw, I, I know there's not everybody may have the same um, let's say energy levels and uh, motivation, access to information as I had. Um, so as a result of through um, versus arthritis, they advised me about ACT. And I was really key. I thought well, that could be something that hopefully as a person with lived experience, I could and give my experience of working, um, or sorry, not working, of um, my experience of having a long-term health condition or developing a long-term health condition later on in life. And as a result of that, I got involved in the lived experience um, group on a monthly basis. And then I got involved with the Training for Trainers course as well. So that's really a um, bit about my disability and um, obviously my, uh, my involvement with APT. Thank you. Can you tell me a bit about uh, how your disability affects you in the workplace? Certainly. Well, I have to self-manage my osteoarthritis every day um, because I'm still working from home and even driving as well. Though I, 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 I start to go out and, out, out and about a bit more and so use the car. But I have to watch what I do. I have to take my medication every day. I have to do my exercises every day. Um, so in terms of working from home, I'm obviously sitting looking at you at the moment, but I have another screen that I can watch this side and I have specialist equipment that's been set up and I have to use my Dragon voice recognition software. I've got an ergonomic keyboard and um, I've got a um, specially adapted mouse as well. I've got a laptop razor, I've got a smart pen, and I've got Bluetooth headset. Now, if I didn't use them, then I wouldn't be able to do my job. So as a result of being um, um, assessed and receiving that equipment, I am able to actually do my job. Whereas if I didn't have this access to this equipment, I would not be able to continue working. And I have to be very careful as well, because often I can get flare ups, you know, if I don't have um, or if my hands are feeling okay, like today they're actually, they're okay. And I think, oh, do you know, I'll just type. Tomorrow I could say no, and then that's going to affect my performance because it's not just the pain in my hands, because then I get fatigued, I get really tired. And so it affects my all round um, performance um, as well. And I need to take more breaks. So this is where preventative measures need to be put in place for me and I need to sit properly. I've got a specially adapted chair as well and I make sure that my 
um, the equipment and everything, and that, I, that actually makes sure my posture is good um, as I sit there. So in terms of my disability affecting me in the workplace, if I didn't have the equipment that I have, then I wouldn't be able to do my job and I have to do the preventative stuff. And I need to put that in place. And obviously for driving, I have to watch when I'm driving that I hold the steering wheel, I've got a um, cover that I put on the steering wheel that actually expands the um, expands the width of the steering wheel. So actually it's more comfortable for my hands as well. Yeah. Um, and see, it's a, that equipment that you mentioned there, was that um, provided through access to work? It was, Danielle, yes. Um, when I was diagnosed with the, with osteoarthritis 18 months ago, I knew about access to work, but interestingly, my, pl my employer didn't. So because I'd worked in the in the charity sector with a, with a number of people with disabilities and long-term health conditions over, goodness, what, 30 odd years, I knew about access to work, but I knew that it's, it's it can sometimes be, it's not the most... Um, flowing of processes but I did say to my employer we need to put in an application but as my employer you need to do the application on my behalf so as a result of eventually getting assessed that uh, that equipment was put in and it's been an absolute lifeline um, for me and I was very impressed with access to work once I got through the system because the um, man who assessed me told me about equipment I didn't even think I would need. I knew somebody had mentioned about Dragon software, but nobody had said about, say, this laptop that I've got in front of me that, and I've got two screens that I need to sit properly, um, that I need to, I've got the ergonomic keyboard and I've got the mouse pad as well and the smart pen. Oh, I had no idea such yeah. equipment. So I was, I was, I'm very grateful to Access to Work for providing that for me. Yeah, that, that sounds like a really sort of positive experience and positive support for you in maintaining yeah. um, your employment. Is there anything else um, you, you can tell us about um, support you've provided that has helped to um, maintain um, or retain your employment? Yep. Um, well, when I, when, I first was, when I was first diagnosed, during the time that I, because my hands were so sore, I had a, a, a short period of being off sick. And during that time, that's when my employer started to process the access to work um, application, if you like. And then my boss, my uh, line manager kept in touch um, sort of on a weekly or a fortnightly basis just to see how things were. And I actually um, kept them informed as well of the support that I was receiving through either different charities or my doctor or whoever and um, when I was coming back to work I was um, put on a phased return and my, my line manager met with me on a weekly basis um, as well just to see how things were and if I could increase my hours so that was that was a positive um, What well, after returning to work and getting up to full-time um, hours I had advised them that I do that I got a lot of support from versus arthritis and I was prepared to do I'd, li I'd quite like to do some volunteering so they allow me um some time off um as a, I mean not not a lot but they give me if I want to to attend any sort of training or um help with my arthritis I can go along to these obviously they'll tend to be online so I, I'm fully supported to attend any meetings and and for APT as well I attend these meetings and my full, my employer um, gives me um, full permissions if you like um, to do that and I meet with her meet with my line manager once a week and can check in with her anytime just to let her know about my uh, about my hands but um, yeah that was the that was the, the at least when I advised them about access to work, they then started to make the process and um, put the process in place. A bit of a learning curve for everybody, but yes, yes, ended on the whole positively. Yes, yes. Um, how um, do you think good practices could be implemented into policy making in the workplace? Well. I think, well, not in this post, but a post I had before about four or five years ago, this was something that we looked at um, and we, we um, myself and the team I was involved in, we ran what was known as a hidden talent seminar. And that was actually looking at how to um, recruit and or retain people with disabilities 
or long-term health conditions. So we got a number of, we've got about a dozen employers who came along to um, the organisation and we created a very open, safe and honest environment where we as a team led by example, we had good practice um, and we made it, as I say, a safe environment for people to ask questions, to make mistakes, if you like, with language or whatever, um, because I think sometimes employers can feel quite fearful that they're making they're making the wrong they're making the wrong decision or the wrong mistake. Um, so I think the, the I think by good practice should be implemented with communication with various um, organisations out there. Now whether that is apt um, or any other organisation that that works with, with um, disabled people or people with long term health conditions, I think it's a case of really I suppose it's tackling or raising awareness about people's unconscious bias that was a big part of the day that we had um was actually and it, it can be quite uncomfortable I know that um because people can feel oh, what is this about um I'm being criticized but I think by raising awareness about that um and by doing so I think that helps to how can I say it, it would help to raise raise awareness about it but that reasonable adjustments can be when I say easily put in place, it doesn't. Things don't need to spit cost thousands or to, to to actually implement that just by simply where somebody sits or just making sure communication is clear or by asking that person who has the disability or long term health condition what their needs are, rather than assuming oh this is what they'll need or turning a blind eye to it and thinking oh or that fear thing. Try not to be fearful. We're all, as as I've as I've always say, we're only human at the end of the day. You just need to ask us what our needs are. And I think we involve in disabled people or or people with long term health conditions in making the policy. And I suppose part of you, being an employee is how how you I know, I know that often many people don't say that they've got a disability when they're in employment and um, they can feel maybe that might go against them but I think that's all about reviewing your recruitment processes and it should be a positive step yeah. um, and not a negative and then by by involving people by recruiting more people with disabilities or long-term health conditions and involving them in making policies or reviewing policies and um, then that actually makes things much more yeah. real and and workable yeah. positivity for and through I think with our yes 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 I don't know if this is something you've had much experience of um but um I was wondering if you could tell me what you think the support supported employment programs could do better um not in this post but my post before we provided supported employment um, on a sort of recruitment to a uh, um, not so much really recruitment processes to with employers. Um, but what I found, what speaking with other um, professionals or colleagues in the field, that it was very very time limited. Whereas when we were supporting people um, to look at um, people that were deaf, deaf and or hard of hearing to go into employment. Um, it was they, they, this was long term. That this was not. There was no time. So I think for me now with a disability, that if there was pressure on me, to, if I wasn't working, um, then I would find it really difficult to think. Right, you've got to be in, and you've got to get to a certain stage by six months, or or and then we pull out our services after twelve months. I think if supported employment, from what I know, if it's not just three months or six months or a year that it should be there um, for as long term as possible. And I know that gets back to funding and things, uh, but certainly maybe a longer term and and just go with the flow of people's disability going up and down or flare ups or whatever. Um, and you've been able to dip in and out of supported employment services. Yeah. Um, what does being a disabled person in employment do for you and your wellbeing like overall? Um, uh, certainly for me, I still work at home, um, Danielle, as a result of the pandemic, although I am getting out and about a bit more um, with um, external organisations, going to different meetings and conferences and things. But I just feel so grateful and delighted that I've been able to retain my job. And that is as a result of um, 
my employer's support, but having access to access to work and having the equipment put in place. My job or this job gives me um, a purpose, a daily purpose. It's boosted my confidence because I think looking back when I was first diagnosed, I, without being too melodramatic, I thought, oh my God, is that is that my life over? Am I not going to be able to work? And having supported people over the years, I was suddenly finding I might lose my job. And then that would have a huge impact on being able to afford my house, my bills, um, being able to eat, um, food, socialising, et cetera. We'd have had, and all because I had sore thumbs. I mean, that's the basic. All because I'd been diagnosed with osteoarthritis at the base of my thumbs. My whole life was going to change. But as a result of getting the, as much support as I could in at the time, then that's how um, my well-being has continued to keep fairly high um, as a result of that. Yeah. Um, what do you think are the key things you've learned, uh, apart from all the things you said already, uh, uh, as part of your employment journey today? Um, I think I, I think I'm going to say I'm lucky in a sense that I've got seem to have a, a quite an inner determination and resilience, Danielle, that I know not many people might have. Because yeah. um, even in my worst moments, when I could hardly move my hands, I thought, no, I, I'll be fine. I'll be OK. I mean, obviously, I did have other moments. That I thought, no, I'm not going to be fine. We're OK. Yeah. Um, but there must be some there must be some inner strength or some determination. And I, and I knew that having worked in various support services over the years that there, had, that there must be some sort of support, no matter how small, out there that I could access. Um, I think one of the biggest things I've learned to do is to pace myself. You know, I think I mentioned earlier about my hands can flare up. And then if if I, I don't look after, if I don't put the um, preventative stuff in place beforehand, then I think, oh, great, my hands are fine today. So I'll, I'll do this, this and this. And then two, three days later or the next day, I'm in agony. Um, with my hands, so I would say it was a, it's been a rather roller coaster ride as well because my access to although I had an inner determination, my access to services it, sometimes I just came across things by luck rather than oh right you definitely find this I was ending up and because I was using my hands without access to work um, equipment. My hands were flaring all the time because I was trying to go on my computer. I was trying to go on my iPad. And it, and at times I had to get my husband or my sister or somebody to actually help me access that because I thought there must be something I can do. Um, but I'm aware that not everybody has that. Uh, and, you know, it, it, thankfully, it is just the base of my thumbs at the moment, albeit I have had pain up my left arm because I overdid it last week. Um, so I've got to be very, very careful. So I think the key things I've learned is all about preventative measures in place and that I have got an inner determination and actually being able to source source resources um, easily. Um, that that's not been been an easy thing to do. But once you get once you get through like access to work, once you get through that, it's incredible. You know, it's like the, the Garden of Eden. You open the door and go, woo, great, you took me up. We've got all this information. We've got all this stuff here. Um, when you don't have, it's like, oh, my goodness, you knock on the door and nothing's happening. You try somewhere else and you, you, you keep getting met with barriers. But once you get through them, it's just incredible how much support is out there. Yeah, um, I think it's like a minefield in life. Yes. Unless you know what, yeah. what you know now. Definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah. Um, I just have um, one last question. Um, what tips would you give to employers as a disabled employee with regards to employing and retaining a diverse workforce? Well, I think I've already mentioned this before, but certainly speak to the person directly that has the disability or long-term health condition and ask them what their needs are um, and how they, what, what things they have in place out with work. Because I think we've had the conversation before, Danielle, that, you know, our disability doesn't just stop. <laughs> it doesn't just start at nine o'clock and finish at five, you know, and, and uh, it's there all the time. So we, 
we are the experts, if you like, without sounding too arrogant. We know what our needs are to a certain degree. Um, so asking the person, I, you know, that I think, and keeping communication clear and open and honest, um, be aware or become really familiar with access to work. Um, the positive, as well as the intricacies involved of the application process. Um, I think training is a really big area as well, disability training. Um, to access that and have, have people, you know, the experts come in and, and give it some sort of disability training and, and refresh your training as well, that you don't just say, oh, well, that's it, we've done that this year, you know, because you would imagine your, your workforce, employer's workforce will change from, well, month to month, but year to year. So to have sort of some sort of ongoing um, training would be... Um, would be ideal, well, say ideal, but would be beneficial. And I know from my own experience, it's much more cost effective to keep someone, to retain someone in the role than to just allow a person who's perhaps developed a disability um, to, to, to allow them to, I, for whatever, when actually with, a, with, a, with going through access to work process, you can get all this equipment and it keeps that person in, um, in a role, it keeps their lives going, their well-being, and, and and keeps the expertise within the organisation um, as well. And I think recruitment-wise, if you actually open up your recruitment to disabled people and or people with long-term health conditions, then you'll have a much wider choice of applicants, especially at the moment when there's so few people um, around to in, in all various um, sectors, and you would you'll you'll gain a much wider range of skills and abilities and have a, a much richer and diverse workforce um, as a result. And I know, again, for myself, many people do say that people that have disabled employees, they tend to, um, they're more productive, uh, they're not often sick as much, um, and they tend to stay longer. There's a, there's a bigger commitment to staying with their employers um, as well. But as I, as I say, and I, I always say all the time, but is try not to feel too fearful of us as disabled people. At the end of the day, we're only human. Um, and we are, are we know what we need to a certain degree. Um, and if, 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 you, if employers can, can meet halfway, then that's just fantastic. Mm -hmm.